everyone, this is Myth, your life and performance coach, and welcome to the Actually You Can podcast. Actually You Can is more than just a fun phrase to say. It's a philosophy of limitless potential, a mindset, an attitude, a conviction. Most importantly, it's about to make you achieve what you might never have thought possible. On this show, we discuss strategies for growth for ambitious individuals looking to achieve big things and live a thriving, fulfilled life. You'll hear from inspiring guests who share their journeys, challenges, and lessons learned. And I'll be sharing insights and actionable takeaways from my Aligned Results Framework that will help you to align your goals, mindset, and strategies to reach your highest potential. Be sure to hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to so you can easily find this podcast again and stay updated with new episodes dropping every week. Building a successful career is a goal that many of us strive for. However, navigating the complexities of the job market and finding the right path can be challenging. In today's episode with Mark Hirschberg, a fractional CTO and author of The Career Toolkit, we explore the key factors that contribute to a successful career and how to overcome common obstacles along the way. We cover everything from strategies to discover your dream job, the significance of networking, to identifying the need to career pivot and mastering the art of making one. We also talk about the influence of AI on the job market and the importance of focusing on your innate human strengths in the face of technological advancement. So if you're looking to find more fulfillment in your career, then this episode is for you. Let's jump in. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. It's so wonderful to have you here today. Well, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. And we're going to be talking to how to build a successful career. And I'm so excited to have you on here because you have such a breadth and depth of experience in this area. And before we dive into that, I would love for you to share a little bit more about yourself with the audience. Who is Mark and what do you do? I have this interesting dual career. I came out of MIT in the 90s and I started as a software developer. And I continued my career path where I quickly started running software engineering teams. And I've helped traditional startups. I've helped Fortune 500s who want to play startup. And these days I work as a fractional CTO, CPO, chief technology officer, chief product officer. So companies will bring me in when they say, we don't need someone full-time in the C-level role, but we need a little guidance. Or there might be a company where someone is in the role and says, I have 120% of my time allocated. This isn't working. Can you take some of this for me? And so I fill a role with a certain number of hours a week at my clients. Although these days I've actually, we're recording this in the fall of 2023. These days I have a lot more short-term engagements of companies asking me to help with AI strategy because that's been on everyone's mind. But in addition to this, I have this second parallel career. Because many years ago, when I recognized that I wanted to become a CTO, I said, well, how do I get there? And I realized there were a number of skills I needed. It wasn't just about being a good engineer. I also needed to be a good leader. I had to know how to hire people, to build teams, to communicate effectively. All these other skills, no one ever taught me. We didn't have podcasts like this back then, so I had to figure this out on my own. And as I was learning, I recognized these skills are not just for C-level executives. They are for everyone. Down to your summer interns, everyone needs these skills. And I began to upskill not only myself, but my team. And as I was doing that, MIT had gotten feedback from companies saying, we want to see these skills in the people we hire. Not just students from your school, not just engineers, but everyone everywhere we hire, we need these skills and we can't find it. So MIT wanted to put together a program to teach these skills. When I heard about it, I said, well, I've developed some content. Why don't you take it? Hopefully this helps. I thought that would be it, one and done. But instead, MIT asked me to develop more content and then to stay and teach. So in parallel to my work as a CTO, CPO, I've also been teaching for over 20 years at MIT's Career Success Accelerator program. I've taught some other universities as well, and then turn that into the book, the career toolkit, the speaking I do, and then the Brain Bump app. So two careers, education and technology. And so it sounds like from a relatively young age, you had a sense of what you wanted to do in a career. Is that 
correct? Yes and no. And <laughs> depends what you mean by young age. When I was five, I wanted to be a stockbroker. And when I was nine, I wanted to be a physicist. I do have a degree in physics, but in the 90s, physics funding was declining and various factors contributed to me thinking maybe I shouldn't go into physics. I should go into my other degree, electrical engineering, computer science, and I followed that path. So I had some direction. It changed from when I was a kid, but it wasn't every week something different. By age nine, I was pretty set. And it was in ninth grade that I got interested in computers. And then once I did start my career journey, it was early on that I recognized here's where I want to wind up and was able to move forward. But even if you don't know where you want to go, there are exercises and activities you can do to figure it out. And you mentioned that there's activities that you can do to figure out where you'd like to end up. And you've developed these sorts of exercises. What hints were you getting along the way potentially that supported you to develop these exercises that were giving you an indication of like, ah, this is what I need to do to figure out where I want to end up? What clues were you getting? Looking at other people and seeing whether they were happy or not. So some classic cases, lawyers. Lawyers in the U.S. are notorious for getting excited about the law because when you grow up, you watch law TV shows and they're all very exciting. You've got dramatic courtroom. It looks great. And then you go to law school and you're writing papers and you're really debating the foundations of law. And then you go into law, especially in big law, although small law has its issues too. Go into big law. What happens? You're working 90 plus hours a week. You have no life whatsoever. And the job you're doing, it's not exciting drama. Most people in big law, you don't enter a courtroom until you're a partner. You don't do that as an associate. And you're not debating constitutional issues. You're saying they're redlining contracts. You're going, oh, look at this detail and let's argue over paragraph two, subclause three, article A at 11 o'clock at night while your friends are out partying and they hate it. They hate their lives. And it's because what they thought the job was, what we saw on TV or thought it was in law school is very different from the reality. Doctors love helping people. They all hate paperwork. If you're going to be a doctor practicing medicine, you're doing lots of paperwork. And so it's understanding there's the outside looking in view of the job. Typically what we see, mostly from Hollywood, it shows kind of the glamour, the excitement. It doesn't show the monotony. And many of us, we really have to understand what exactly the job entails. Because I'm going to bet whatever job you have, when you looked at the job description, it didn't say you're going to spend 10 hours a week in meetings and responding to a constant barrage of emails. That was not in the job description, although that was very much known to the company ahead of time. And you need to decide, is that where you want to be? We see people quitting because they say, I don't want to spend 20 hours a week in meetings. We should have had that discussion before you came to this job because that's what we needed. And we will have saved us both some time. So it's really recognizing it's not just the top line job title, it's the actual day-to-day -day work in the job and making sure that aligns. And you mentioned that we see uh, particular careers are portrayed in a particular way in the media. And I think there's some s careers that by definition from society are successful and, and desirable. What is your definition of a successful career? Successful career is one that meets your needs. That's it. Pretty basic. <laughs> For some people that might mean, I want to make as much money as possible. As long as I'm making lots of money, I'm happy. I think far fewer people actually have that metric than think they have it. It could be, I want a good work-life balance, or I want a impactful job where I help society, help an industry or help my clients. It could be I like certain challenges. There are people who say, I want to be on the road traveling four out of five days. Great. And there are people who say, I really don't want to do that. Great. Both of you can have a successful career with very different jobs because they meet your needs to keep you on the road or not. So it's coming down. And when I talk to people, the questions to ask about your job, there are some like, how much travel do you want or how many hours in meetings? But also comes down to lifestyle, really where you are in life. 
Because if you need that vacation home in Miami, you need a job that will give you the money for it. If you don't need that, you can take a job that gives you less money and you can be happy with that. So it comes down to your definition of happiness. And when you plan your career, it starts with planning your life because your career should fit into your life instead of trying to build a life around your job. I love how you phrase that. And I think it's really common to see people who expect big, wonderful things for your job. And I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, but I think it's unrealistic to love every moment of your job. Just with life in general, there's always good bits and the not so good bits. Like for every great project you get to work on, there'll be maybe 10 hours of meetings that you don't want to be in that you have to sit in as part of the journey to get there. And I'm fortunate enough that I work with some really passionate individuals who commit a lot of heart and soul to their work. What, what do you think is the, I'm trying to figure out how else to explain this, in terms of people finding purpose in their work and work being a really big component of your life, how do you support people to shift that perception and plan their life and see how their work fits into it rather than the other way around? It begins with questions about your life. Now, some are very basic, like where do you want to live? Because if you want to live in Iowa, which is in the middle of the United States, and you want to be an oceanographer, you've got a problem. Not a lot of oceans in Iowa. And so you have to recognize more practically, it might be you want to get to the top of the financial services world. There's a handful of cities you need to be in, New York, London, Hong Kong where you can do that, it's harder to do that in St. Louis or Toronto. So you have some alignment there. You might say, how many hours do I want to work? If you aren't willing to work 90 some hours, you're not going to get far in big law. You're not gonna do one consulting if you don't want to travel. So you have to ask, what is the lifestyle I want? This comes to questions of when I want to have kids. This should be a question both men and women are asking. Unfortunately, we tend to put that more on the women. But men, you should be asking this too because you should be helping out or understanding what the expectations are with your spouse and then incorporating that into your decision making. And it's asking these lifestyle questions about money, about flexibility, about impact. And of course, we're not going to get exactly everything we want. We will make this trade off. So maybe it is a little more travel than you want, but it's really impactful and it pays well. And so, what are the things you're willing to trade off? Do you have any? thresholds or boundaries. All right, look, I don't want to travel more than five days a month, but all right, this job, it's seven days, but everything else is great. I can do that. Or maybe no. In fact, maybe based on what I've committed with my spouse, I can't be away more than X days a month because I have childcare duties. So it's understanding these different things and then finding the career and the jobs that fit into your larger goals. And you mentioned before, there's sometimes a discrepancy between, I guess, what the career looks like on paper and the job that looks like on paper. And then you get into the role and you're like, ah, oh, this isn't what I thought it was, or this isn't what I thought I signed up for. What are some tips that you could provide on how someone could get a, a clearer picture of exactly what a role entails before they commit to doing that role? So if I was interested in law, how would I get an understanding of the reality of law? before realizing that I'm just underlying contracts for the next 10 years of my life. We can do this both for the industry and then we can do it for the specific job. For the industry, when you're thinking, do I want to go into this industry? Or for example, I'm an engineer, do I want to move into a director of engineering or VP of engineering role? Or do I want to stay an individual contributor? Talk to people further down the path than you and ask, tell me about your day. How do you spend your time? What do you do? What are the skills you need? What are the big challenges? What are the risks? What do you like? What don't you like? And talk to multiple people. So as a CTO, that job tells you a little about what I do. It says, I'm not doing accounting, but it doesn't necessarily tell you a lot. I know CTOs who are CTOs of a team of five people at a 12-person startup. And that guy is spending at least half his day writing code. He is a CTO, has the same title I do, writes code because there's not a lot of meetings at a 12-person company. Big things writing code. I know CTOs who are overseeing a team of 2,500 people. Same title I have, same title as at first person. Not only is she not writing code, her subordinate's subordinates probably are not writing code. 
they're middle managers. And so the nature of her job is very different than the nature of his job, even though all three of us have the same title. So just understand titles alone don't tell you where you're going, understanding this title in this type of company, this type of role, and there's more than one answer. And you might say, I prefer the big company jobs or I prefer the startup jobs. So you can start to ask people, what are the options? And sound, oh, these sound good, not those, or none of these sound good, I shouldn't go down that path. So you can sound out what it's going to be. Now, when it comes to an individual job, during the interview process, we should actually be asking these questions. Okay, great. I'm a software engineer. You're asking me tech questions. I'm answering. You're telling me I'm writing code. Well, let's actually talk about day to day. How many meetings per week does a typical engineer sit through? What are they? How often do you have people travel? Ask whatever questions are appropriate to the role. And it's okay to ask. And if you're not sure how to ask, I have on the blog on my website, I have a list of questions to ask about corporate culture, about management style, about what it's like, and then even how to ask. And here's how to ask. Because you're seeing the interviewer saying, I want to ask them, by the way, how many meetings a week do I have to sit through? But that sounds rude. How do I ask this? You can say, I was listening to this career expert, Mark Hirschberg, and he said, I should ask these questions. We should have a discussion so we're both on the same page. You can blame me. Makes it a lot easier because you don't sound like a jerk. You go, this guy, Mark, he said we need to do this. You and I, because again, you as a hiring manager, if you need someone who wants 20 hours a week in meetings, and I'm not that person, let's find out now and not two months into the job. Now, if the manager pushes back, says, oh, I refuse to answer this. First, that's a warning flag. But you can also say, oh, okay, sorry, just this guy, he must be nuts. You can put the risk on me and not on you. And that often makes it easier to bring up in the interview process. Thank you for sharing that. I'll definitely pop a link to your blog in the show notes. And it's I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this as well. So you've gone through the interview process. You think you've got a solid idea of what the job is. And then you land the job. And I hear this all too often. And, and I mean, guilty as charged here. I've been in my current role for nearly four years. But prior to that, I was probably in a role between a year and 18 months. And then I was like, no, nah, this is not for me. I'm out. What's your thoughts on, I guess, tenure in a role? I know I'm not alone in this. I know many of my peers who have had similar experiences, they get a year into their job and they're like, I'm just not feeling this anymore. And then you have that sort of conflict where you're like, oh, I should stick with this. Maybe it's not the job. Maybe it's me or uh, I don't know what I want to do or I just don't want to bounce around jobs. What were your thoughts first and foremost on someone choosing a role and then what happens around that year period? Because I feel like there must be something there. I feel like I'm not the only one who starts to question the meaning of life after a year in a job. <laughs> Whenever you have questions, you need to seek answers. The wrong thing to do is say, I'm not happy here. I'm just going to go find something new. Because you never want to run from, you want to run to. Just say, I don't like this job, find a new one. If you don't understand what went wrong, why this job is no longer a fit, you might make the same mistakes. So start to ask yourself, why is this no longer a fit? Is it the job wasn't what it was? I sucked it up and dealt with it for a while, but I'm at my wit's end. Is it the job was what I wanted back then, but my needs have changed? Has the job changed? Because you might have a new boss or new directive or new project. Has it changed in some way? Given where it is today, how temporary or permanent is this? We talked about that earlier. No job is going to be perfect. Sometimes, hey, you're on this project for the next couple months. It's not going to be fun. And that's just life. But over your four years at this company, what's three months? On the other hand, I remember going on a date many years ago with a woman who said she just got assigned to some new project. She really didn't like it. Really hated it, in fact. I asked her, well, how long is the project? No, oh, it's going to be 18 months to two years. It's like, how can you tolerate that for two years? That's not just, okay, fine, I have to do this. That's a, that's a whole job. You should move. Now, even if this job at this moment is not a fit, and you decide it's not a long-term fit, for whatever reason, it's not just this is a temporary project, 
the job changed, your needs changed, before you run away, can you turn this into something that is a fit? Can you talk to your manager and maybe get assigned to a different project or different role on this project or something where you're going to transition off, maybe not tomorrow, but in six months? Maybe there are other roles at this company that you can find. If none of that really works, then you need to define what is the proper role, make sure this does not and cannot meet that role, and then go and find that proper role. Yeah, and I think that's something I talk to my clients a lot with as well is how to find fulfillment in any situation. And and more specifically, if they come to me and they're not finding fulfillment in their career, I'm like, okay, well, what have you done to actively contribute to your fulfillment in this role? Now, it's not up to the organization to hand you something fulfilling on a platter. Only you can add the spices and the ingredients that it needs to be fulfilling. And so I'm a really big advocate on people taking personal responsibility for their own fulfillment. And I'm interested to hear from your point of view, what are some questions someone could ask to make sure they know what they want in a career so they can have these really robust conversations with their managers or or get that clarity before deciding, no, this role isn't for me. There's nothing we can do about this. Or yes, we can just make these little tweaks and, and we're good. This is, I have a list of 20 questions on my website. We'll get a link to that as well in the show notes. And these are starting questions. That's not a total comprehensive list. But the questions first, as we noted earlier, begin with your lifestyle and what you want. They're questions to ask of yourself. How many hours a week do you want to work? Do you want to work primarily by yourself or in a team? Do you want to be managing other people? Do you want to just, again, be by yourself? And just say, okay, I'm, I'm here, put me in a corner, I'll call you when I'm done. Do you want to regularly collaborate with others or with your manager? So there's lots of, and these are just some of the questions. Do you want to work with computers? Some people like being in front of a computer all day. Some people do not. These are basic questions. And then, of course, nature of the role and challenges you want. We want to ask these questions of ourselves. And it's okay if you don't have all the answers. By the way, if you're not sure, do I want to be customer facing or not? I don't know. Let me talk to people. Let me talk to the ones who are customer facing. They'll say, it's great. You're constantly meeting new people. They'll say, but it's a pain because customers are always a pain and they're yelling at you and complaining. And then you need to decide which sounds right for me. Maybe you even take a job and you say, I'm going to do this for two years and try it. And then either I love it and keep doing it or it's not for me. I'll find something else. So a bunch of questions to ask. But it's as much about your life as the actual job. By the way, how many hours in meetings? That's a good question too, but that's not the starting question. I really love how you keep bringing it back to it's your life. Like stop looking at your job like a job and just one sort of siloed element of your life. Look at your whole life as a whole because I also believe that we don't operate in silos. If something's going on in your relationship, it's going to infiltrate other areas of your life. Same as if something's going on at work, that's going to impact other areas of your life. So I, I really love that you are keep referring to your overall life view. And so I'm interested as well, you know, if someone's identified what they want, and I see this all too often with my friends as well, and I've been guilty of similar is, you know, this isn't the right fit, but it's really hard to leave. Like whether you're loyal to the organization or you're like, maybe I should just stick it out a little bit longer. You know, I've only been here a year or so. What would you say to someone who knows deep down that they need to make a change or whether that's have that conversation with the boss to tweak their role or they need to leave the organization entirely? What advice would you give that person? or What would you say to that person? Start with effectively a pros and cons list. What is it that's keeping you there? There's something good. And it could be your work spouse, your friends there, the culture. It could be the mission. It could be the pay. Let's find out what that is. Then let's talk about what isn't there, what's missing or is problematic. And first, can you change that ratio? Maybe if you're not getting enough pay, can you work towards a raise? If it's not the project you like, can you find a similar project at that organization? Maybe if you're not growing, can you find a way, talk to your manager, how can you get me on a growth path? So you don't have to just write it off. But first, you do have to identify what changes would make this a better fit. If it's 
not a face say, well, nothing can change here. Here's what it is. Here are the pros and cons. Now let's look at what are the other options. Now, this is a little abstract. You don't know exactly the job out there, but you're going to have some sense. What's the economy like? Oh, we're in a terrible recession right now. I might not be able to find a job with more pay or a job at a similar type of company because the competitors are all laying people off. Or the economy is doing well and there's growth and there's opportunity. I can find a job where I can work from home, where I don't have to dress up for work or company that has less meetings. I think that's out there. Let me ask. So once you identify what needs to change, you can say, how likely is it I can find that? And remember, of course, that probably everything that's a positive about your current job, not guaranteed to be equally positive in the new one. So make sure not only are you getting that change from bad to good, but everything else doesn't worsen significantly to offset. Yeah, I'm just thinking you could be looking at that list and you go, oh, there's this one thing that really pisses me off about this job and it's fixed in a new one, but everything else starts to piss you off because you realize that there was actually some good at that job that you were just too busy focused on the negative as opposed to focusing on the positives. There's the old expression, people say, well, the grass is greener on the other side. And then the take on that, the grass is greener where you water it. And both are true because sometimes... Yeah, this is not going to work. You need to go elsewhere, but you do also have to take at least some partial responsibility in trying to make this opportunity the best fit it can be for you. Most definitely. I really appreciate that. And you mentioned briefly just asking people what an experience in a role is, or if you're curious about a particular career, finding someone in that career um, to have a chat to. How important is networking? in finding a successful career or what success have you found with some of the people you've worked with and networking? Networking is by far the best way to find an opportunity. When I am seeking a candidate, I will get stacks of resumes sent in. Going through stacks, often I'm looking at a resume for five to 10 seconds. But if someone I know says, Mark, here's someone you should talk to. Here's someone right for the role. I will first look at that resume for a good 20, 30 seconds. And unless there's a clear red flag or no, she's not quite a fit, she moves to the front of the line. She gets an automatic interview. That's what networking does. It opens doors for you. Now, that's for the job hunt. Networking can do a lot of other things from helping you find clients, helping you find partners, find customers, giving you information, help you stay abreast of trends in the industry. It can open doors to a lot more than jobs. We're talking about in the context of job hunt. I think that's how you ask the question. But in your career, recognize that your network can help you grow and help you in a lot more ways than just how do I get a new job. The key thing about a network is you need to build it in advance. Here's the mistake I see people make. Like, okay, I'm I'm unemployed. I need to find a job. I'm going to go to this event, maybe some industry event, Go, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Mark. Listen, I'm looking for a job. You have a job like this? Nope. Okay, thanks. Hey, you over there. Hi, I'm Mark. Do you have a job? Okay, no, thanks. Just going from person to person. Imagine if we're sitting there at a bar. I meet you tonight. We're chatting a bit. I say, hey, you know, you seem really great. So listen, this weekend, I've got to pack up my entire apartment. I got to carry my couch down three flights of stairs and move to a new place. Seem like a cool guy. Want to come help me do it this weekend? What? Come in. Aren't we friends? We, we just spent two hours having beers. Why aren't you helping me? Yeah, we may have just met, but you're not ready to give the person that favor. On the other hand, I called up my best friend from high school and said, listen, I need a favor. I'm just so crazed. I need help packing my apartment. He's going to show up for me because we have that relationship. The relationship got built long before I made the request. And when we're networking, networking is about relationships. It's not about adding people on social media. It's not about getting a large number of followers. It's about building relationships and you need to build the relationship before you can make the request. So I'm not saying you can't go to an event and say, I'm looking for a job, but if you really want to use your network, it's people you met long before you need to make that ask. Yeah. And I guess there's certain situations like job fairs and stuff like that, where going up and essentially asking for a job would probably expect it. Um, and to your point, that's not though, networking. Going, that's just right. That's I mean, it's like going, going to a job fair. Yeah. 
Right. If you go on speed dating, I sit down across from you. I'm like, hey, let's talk for two minutes because I'm interested in you. That's not weird. If I did that at Starbucks, that's going to be a little weird. So weird. there is yeah. some <laughs> contextual awareness and contextual expectations. And and so I guess when I was first introduced to networking, my gut reaction was like, oh, it feels like a little slimy. It feels like a little salesy to me. And how I approach it is I find people that I want to connect with and I just want to offer them value. And so I, I find cool people that I want to bring into my network. I'm like, I don't know. I don't want anything from you at this point of time, but I know you're cool. I want to have you around in my ecosystem. And then potentially one day I'll, I'll need to ask you a question or I'll need to ask a favor. But I, I definitely approach networking from who are people that I just want to hang around in and who are people I'm interested in. It's not I'm asking something from them. It's just finding your type of people. How would you approach networking for someone who is maybe a little bit unsure about it? Well, you've hit upon the right mentality. Each of these skills I cover in the book begins with a mental shift, how to look at differently. And most people look at networking in the transactional sense. As a CTO, salespeople love reaching out to me because they say, oh, this guy, he's able to write checks and buy things. And I get people saying, oh, we'd love to just network with you and get to know you, or we're going to be in town, come join us for lunch. They don't want to get to know me. They want to sell me something. And that yeah. is not networking, that's sales. And it's fine if you say, we want to sell you something, please come out to lunch. Okay, I'm not going to do that, but you were honest, let's be upfront. But when they pretend that's networking, that's what really bothers me. They are being disingenuous. They only care about me because of what they can get from me. Networking is about relationships. You didn't pick your friend saying, oh, I want to be friends with you because. Maybe you did that in third grade because you want to be with a popular kid. But today... Hopefully that's not what you do. You say, you're a good person. I want to get to know you. I'm not going to have you as my friend because I'm thinking, what can I get from her down the road? They might not be your friends. It might be more of a business relationship, but just say, you're interesting. Let's build a relationship, not because of what I can get. Let's just build a relationship. And one of the great ways to do that is to give before you get. Again, that example of we just met, come help me move my house, not going to happen. But if we get to know each other over time and just hang out, help you out, you're more likely to help me out in the future. So when you have that view of networking, you just say it's relationships. I'm just going to meet good people. It's not slimy at all. And for those who are introverted, for those who are concerned, we also have this view that networking at this big conference and the running around and handing out business cards. Again, that's not networking. Networking is relationship building. Go sit down one-on-one -on -one with someone. That's networking, building a relationship. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be sketchy. It doesn't have to be high volume. It's just about human relationships. And you're right. It's literally that simple, I think, for me as well. I'm quite introverted. And so going to a classic networking event, I'm like, that sounds like my idea of hell. Social media and the internet is responsible for a lot of goods and probably not so good things as well. But I still love the opportunity that uh, platforms like LinkedIn and social media offer to make that initial connection online to then convert to a face-to-face -face catch up if it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So I find that's been another really good tool for me is just leveraging maybe some of those indirect platforms. If you're not someone who's really confident and just going up to someone being like, hi. <laughs> you hit an important distinction. We're going to draw an analogy to dating. Lots of people use dating apps. Now imagine I'm swiping right, swiping right. All of a sudden I swipe right, I match with a girl. I said, oh look, I just matched with Kate. She's my girlfriend. Hey, hold on a second, Mark. You match, she expressed some interest. She's not your girlfriend. You now need to go date her and build a relationship. Then maybe she'll be your girlfriend. And on social media, how often do you say, oh, I just add this person on LinkedIn. Look, my network is now one bigger. It's the same thing. It's swipe right. Oh, that counts as a relationship. It doesn't. Just as when I swipe right on the dating app, I then need to build the relationship. When you talk to someone online or create that connection, by the way, I don't create the connection until I've built the relationship, but some people do it differently. It's the relationship building that's the key piece. Just like on the dating app, it's not the... We both swiped. It's now we're building the relationship. Same thing with LinkedIn 
and other professional networks, it's the relationship building, not the swiping right or the clicking. Definitely. And personally for me, the relationship building and um, can feel like it could be quite challenging. And it highlights to me that even if you find a job that you love and you're on this path to success, there will be challenges and you will need to show resilience. And that's just part of life, I think, in general. If you're interested in growth, you will need to develop some level of resilience to foster that growth. I'm curious to hear for you, were there any challenges you faced in your career where you've had to show that resilience? There are challenges every day <laughs> because I'm not one to say, let me just do this simple job where I sit here doing the same thing every day. I want new challenges. I want to climb new mountains. And that has varied from early on, these skills I now teach, I didn't have. I had to go figure these things out. I had to get better at them. I still work to get better at them because there's no end line. There's no, oh, I've done this. I am now set for life with my leadership or my network or anything else. I'm always growing and learning. But moving into new industries were challenging. Corporate politics, that was a big challenge for me that I had to get better at. Learning new skill sets and failing sometimes. Failing with some of the startups, failing in some of the roles, failing with corporate politics. And the key thing is I would then say, what can I learn from this? How do I avoid repeating this same mistake? How can I do it better next time? And that's what resiliency is for me. And I love that you've shared that you, you know, experienced failures. And I think some people are so scared of, of putting themselves out there for fear of failure and the ramifications of that. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about potentially one of those experiences and just how you dealt with failure. It seems like you just so talk so casually about it. It seems like it was just water off a duck's back. You're like, cool, that thing happened. I learned from it and I moved on. Was it really that simple for you? Years later, I can summarize it simply. It was not that simple at the time. And let me first note, because I suspect you have an international audience, the concept of failure is very different from one culture to another. In the U.S. culture I'm part of, we have, as part of our DNA, risk-taking. The people who came to the U.S. were people who said, my family have, have lived here for generations, and I am going to leave that all behind, risk crossing the sea, which itself is perilous, and then go to this new country where I don't know anyone, might not speak the language well, and I'm going to figure it out. And then the people who are here were told, go west. And go take, they described as virgin territory, it was really the territory of the native people who are here. But again, leave the safety of cities where you have infrastructure and other people you know, and go somewhere and take a risk. And it is that spirit of risk that has led to the U.S. being a leader in innovation, in having startups. Startups fail often. And in the U.S., it was okay to say, I tried to start up and it failed. There are other cultures, and we see this, for example, commonly in Asian culture. Failure is not as well accepted, and we don't see as much or traditionally have not seen as much innovation in certain Asian cultures because you tried a business, it failed, it doesn't look good. And so there's just first recognize your own culture, whether it's your national culture, your ethnic culture, your family culture, you might have a different perspective on risk than other people. And that's okay. There's no one right answer towards risk. I know people who think I'm nuts because I don't know what job I will have in a year or when I would do startups. Startup might not be in business in three months. I look at them and say, you're at a job. I know people have been at the same company for 20 years. And I think, oh my God, that is my nightmare. So we all have different tolerance. You asked for a specific example Early on with corporate politics, I did not do well. And my thinking was, if I do a good job, that's it. I do well. What more is there? Because I came from an engineering background, which is very meritocratous. Whoever gets more answers right on the test is smarter. And there are objective right and wrong answers. But in the corporate world, sometimes having the right relationships, being able to present and be seen as the person responsible, whether or not you were, might matter more than who actually did the work. And I was not prepared for that. 
and I just got the first time it happened, I was utterly blindsided. And it ultimately cost me my job. I just, I really, it bothered me to the core because isn't it about who does the better job? In fact, one of the guys who came after me, he quit two months later where he admitted he couldn't do the job. Thinking, where's the justice? This guy took part of my job, failed at, and yet here I am sitting without a job. That's not right. But I learned how to get better at politics. And later, I didn't necessarily play it as well as I do now, but I saw it coming. And then later I saw it coming and was able to block it. And so each time I get better and better. And I love that you touched on this too, because especially in regards to, I guess, what success looks like at, at school. So I feel I was, I got good grades at school because I knew exactly what was being asked of me in any given moment, what I had to study, what was right, what was wrong. And I felt really comfortable with those guidelines. And you get thrusted into the corporate career where success maybe isn't that black and white. You might not have really clear KPIs or you might not know what's good or what's bad. And you have to figure that out for yourself. And I remember my working with one of my bosses at the time, he's quite a visionary and I would be like, okay, so what do you want from me? What, what does success look like here? And he's like, oh, I have this vision and I'm like, no, 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 like what's right and what's wrong. I need those clear guardrails. And I think it's only when you get put into those corporate environments where you realize things aren't as black and white as maybe you once learned at school. And to your point, there's a lot of other factors at play. Like uh, I would get frustrated working for big corp and I go, oh, I just want to do this thing. And it's like, no, we have to make sure we get buy-in from this team or this team or no, we can't do it for X reasons. And it's like, you might not understand why decisions get made, but it's just having an acceptance of things like politics and past experience and all those sorts of things exist within an organization. And it's taking those into account when you're looking to create change. And I think I'd love to hear from you too in terms of being able to progress in an organization, if, I mean, I'm not sure if it's similar in, in the US, but in Australia specifically, career progression, especially if you're a specialist at a particular skill, often looks moving from that specialist skill set to a management position. And that's traditionally what career progression looks like. And for people who are really specialist at a skill, they might not want to manage people or they might not have those manager skill sets, but they've gone, you're good at this job. Let's put you in a manager position and, you know, good luck. How can someone first and foremost progress in their career if people management isn't something that they're interested in? And what, let's start there before I ask my next question. Let me actually back up to something you mentioned, then I'll address that yeah. question. Because you hit on a very good point. I have a whole chapter dedicated to this topic. It's called working effectively. In school, we had a clear question. Here's a chemical formula, balance the equation, put the answer right here. What elements do you need? Write a 2000 word essay interpreting Romeo and Juliet. Here you go, 2000 yeah. word, double space, exactly as you asked. In the real world, it's not just getting the right answer. It is presenting it the right way. I had, here's another failure. I had a job. The second day, there were already red flags and things were not going well. So two weeks in, I sat down with my manager. I found out he wanted a project plan for me. I said, oh, okay. I thought the plan we had from the vendor was good. I said, no, I want you to give me a plan. Okay, no problem. I'll give you a plan. Just to be clear, what are you looking for? Do you want me to write up a plan? Are you looking for a budget and timeline? Do you want me to do a PowerPoint presentation? What are you looking for? I, I don't know. I, uh -oh. I, I, I don't know. Right then and there, I knew I could not win. Now, that was a bad manager. Even when you have a manager who might be better at answering that question, as you point out, the manager might not know what he wants. Imagine, for example, you've got, I'm going to do a little bit of stereotyping in, in, in this example. Imagine you have a 60 year old head of marketing. And he says, okay, we need to be on TikTok. We need to succeed there. <laughs> what does that mean? He doesn't really know what TikTok is. He knows it's social media. What's well, a little different than the other stuff. He's not even sure the questions to ask. And so you, who might be 24 years old, but know a lot more about TikTok than he does, you need to say, well, here are some things we can do. And what do you think of this way or that way? You sometimes need to help your manager ask the right questions. 
And this is an important skill and not one we teach in school. Now, let's get back to the question you asked, which is going from individual contributor to manager. And in fact, that is one of the hardest transitions because when you are an individual contributor, you start out very junior and you have a small scope of work. They don't expect you to do big projects, just bite size, but that gets bigger and bigger as you progress and become more senior. All of a sudden, when you transition to manager, it's not about your work output. It's about the output of the team. And it's not about I can solve the problem faster or a bigger problem than the next person. It's how do I lead my team to do that? And it's a different set of skills. Now, in the US, it is common as well, and many other places in the world, that you cap out in terms of compensation at a certain level at an individual contributor. Some of the big tech companies here in the US did recognize that. And they said, we're taking our best tech people. They go on and become managers. We're losing a great individual contributor. We're gaining a mediocre manager. This is a lose-lose. And so I've seen in tech, this might be true in other industries as well, they would create parallel tracks where they said, you can continue to progress financially, progress in terms of compensation, and even in some level of responsibility as an individual contributor, because we don't want you to feel pulled towards a job that's not optimal for your skill set. But that's still the rarity here in the US and rarity elsewhere. So you need to understand within your industry and within your company what the options are. Now, I will give one counter argument. Imagine a supermarket chain. You might be the best bagger in the chain, better than anyone else. You can bag groceries like no one's business, but it doesn't matter how good you are, the vice president of inventory is still going to have a bigger impact on the success of the business and will be compensated more no matter how good you are at bagging. So there are some roles, just by the nature of the role, they can't compensate you more because you're not driving more value for the business. Yeah, and then it's going back to what you mentioned earlier is like, how does that fit into your life plan? Like if you don't need to be earning the big bucks and you're quite happy in the role that you're currently in, then great, no problem. Exactly. So start with your life goals because that helps inform your career goals. Being in, in the tech space and we've spoke briefly about AI and I think AI is becoming more and more sophisticated and for a bit of context, I have a background in marketing that was my degree. And so I've seen the benefits of AI and things like copywriting and creating marketing plan and how it can support business in that way. What is your thought on AI and the implications of AI on the job market? I have a lot of writing about this on my blog. If we look historically, technology has always come along and created disruption. 200 years ago, we were all farmers and we sat there on the farm. And if it wasn't for technology, we'd still be farmers. We wouldn't be here doing this because we're too busy on the farm. Thankfully, technology came along and said, you don't need to be on the farm. But what happened is some farmers lost their jobs or some farm workers. Now that transition happened over literally a hundred years during the industrial revolution. And it was relatively slow. So people would leave the farms for the city to get city work. We have seen faster transitions. For example, that literally happened over generations. Consider for example, elevator operators, because when you go back a hundred years, there were people who stood in the elevator. We still see a few of those here in Manhattan where I live and they move the elevator but most of them don't need it. And if you look at the number of elevator operators, there's a period over 10 years where a lot of them lost their jobs, where a lot of elevators converted. And so whereas it was a generational or multi-generational change for the farmers, so the children can move on to something else, here you had people who 40s and 50s, all of a sudden they're told your job, in fact, your whole industry is gone and they had no other skills. And so what, AI is doing, it's not that AI itself is any different in terms of the impact on the job market, but just technological change in general today happens at a faster pace. And so we see a greater rate of displacement. More modern example, think toll booth collectors. How quickly did we go from paying tolls to they all disappeared? 
And so we have to recognize AI will start to eat away at our jobs. Some jobs it will do very quickly. If you are a graphic designer, the images I use for my blogs, I'm now having AI generate. And so they're losing a lot of work wholesale. Other people, it's going to happen more slowly. We'll take lawyers as an example. It can start to do, think a more advanced spell check or grammar check. It can start to do some of the redlining. And if you're a lawyer and your whole job is just redlining, you might be in trouble. But of course you went to law school, your job should be, how do I help you with your legal strategy? Oh, it involves a bunch of redlining, which I guess I have to do. Great. I'm happy to have AI take that over. And so when we think about our jobs, we need to look not again at the job title, but the individual tasks, literally down to, I have to send six times a week a meeting coordination email. Can I offload that to AI and look at which of your tasks will soon be replaced, which will not focus on the latter because that's where you continue to add value. The one caveat, and we'll use lawyers again as the example, lawyers, because they bill by hour, think, wait, if this is taking away the hours of work I do, this is a problem. I can now bill less. I don't know if I like that. Ideally, they say, well, I'm going to bill less per client. That means I'm more accessible to clients. More people will use my services. I can focus on other things. But that can be scary in those intermediate years, especially when people still think, well, lawyers are expensive. This is going to be 30 hours, not three. I can't afford it. So there will be some volatile transition. And same thing in your job. You're going to see what you used to spend time working on, your job, less of this, more of that. And companies might not be expecting that. But prepare because in some number of years, the nature of the roles you get hired for will be more of that. So plan for the future. Yeah. And definitely, I think I when it first came out, I was like, no, nah, that's too... I I'm very much a people person. I, I love working with humans. I'm not even going to get involved in AI. And then I realized very quickly that it's here to stay. And so my mentality shifted very quickly and I really embrace it. I use it every day just to help make my current workflow easier. So whether it's um, helping to improve the way that I communicate with my colleagues to help streamline some of the tasks that, you know, we talked about there's some tasks in any role that you don't particularly enjoy hey, can AI help me with some of those? Great. And so I think, yeah, to your point, it's, it's looking at what innate human strengths do you offer to your role? How can you continue to develop those? And how can you offload or automate some of those more mundane tasks? I think it can be really helpful as well. And so you've offered a whole heap of really great tools and tips that people can use, no matter what sort of stage of their career success journey that they're on. If someone is sitting here, they have a job and they're just starting to question if it's the right role for them. They've potentially done a degree at uni and they've been in that role for maybe four or five years and they're like, I'm not sure if this is what I want to do anymore. What is a really actionable step someone can do to help to move them on a path to their successful career? Talk to other people in your field, even other fields. Listen for what sounds interesting and don't worry about the title because again, you might be an accountant, but you're hearing about your consulting friends who talk about flying off to different, different sites and meeting with different clients. And you think that's really exciting. Okay. You don't want to be a consultant, but can you find an accounting type of job where you might be doing more travel? In fact, if you're doing forensic accounting, you might be spending more time at the client site going through their books, not just on the computer, but you have to be there physically to look through things. So don't think about, is this job right? But think about the different aspects of the job as you talk to different people and what are the components that you like or don't like, and then find jobs that fit this combination of activities that sound ideal to you. Excellent advice. And I really appreciate that you mentioned looking beyond the job title. I think once you realize, once you get a job with a job title, you realize that maybe someone just made up your job title or you can actually just choose your job title. You realize potentially how little weight is actually put in a job title. So it's looking beyond that to actually what the role entails is, is really great advice as well. And to get more advice, you have written an incredible book. Uh, are you able to share with the audience a bit more about your book and what sort of other tips and advice is offered within that book? 
I'll share with you the book and the app. Now, the book is the Career Toolkit book, the website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. And so in the book, there are 10 skills in 10 chapters. These are the skills that we have seen companies and surveys over and over say they want. You've probably seen these surveys. They range from five to 50 skills. It really just depends how you break it down. The 10 skills covered in the book, section one, careers, how to create and execute a career plan. Chapter two, working effectively, those skills like how to actually know what your boss wants and how to give it to her. Chapter three, interviewing, not just as a candidate, but many of us have to hire other people and we have no training in how to do that. So we look at interviewing from both sides of the table. Second section is leadership and management, chapter on leadership, and then one on people management and one on process management. And then the third section, interpersonal dynamics, has chapters on communication, networking, negotiations, and ethics. Each chapter has a mental shift, how to think differently about the skill we talked about for networking, and then concrete, actionable things you can do to improve, followed by a summary and next steps. So that's the book. You can learn more about the book at thecareertoolkitbook.com. On that website, there's also a bunch of free resources. You can download the career questions we talked about. You can download the questions to ask during the interview. There are blog posts where I continually put out more advice. All that's free. Now, there's also an app because one thing I know is when we read a book like mine, you say, wow, this is great advice. And then you forget a few weeks later. There's networking. Do you read it? Sitting at home. Where do you need it? At a conference two months from now. Or those career questions think, yeah, I should sit down and do this, but then you never get to it. So we created the free Brain Bump app. And you can find it if you go to brainbumpapp.com. You can then follow links to go to the store. It's free on Android and Apple. With the Brain Bump app, it has the key takeaways from my book. If you went through my book with a highlighter, all that is in the app for free. But it's not just my book. It has other books, blogs, podcasts, talks. We continually add new content. So it's like a cross between a flashcard app, a book summary, and a daily affirmation app because you get all this information. It's all tagged by topic. So as you're walking into that conference, you can pull out the app in seconds, bring up those networking tips because this is when and where you need it. Or you can set to get a daily reminder. For example, these career questions, maybe you just want to get a reminder every Monday, 8 p.m., just one of them pops up on your phone because you set the reminder. We never send you things you didn't request to get. So 8 p.m. it pops. I say, okay, here's a question. I'm going to think about this for a little bit. Maybe you set it for when you're getting on the subway or about to drive home so you can think of it. Or if you're a new manager thinking, I got to learn all these management tips, 9 a.m. every day, get that management tip popping up on your phone. It stays top of mind. So the Brain Bump app, completely free, brainbumpapp.com, and it will have advice from my book and a number of other sources, all completely free. I know the step that I'm taking when I get off this call is I'm downloading that app. That sounds absolutely incredible. And I'll pop the links to all of those resources in the show notes below. So thank you so much for jumping on today, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing those tips with us. And the time of recording for this is early November. I know it's a, a typically a time of year for reflection. You come back from holidays in the new year and you're like, I need a change. There is no better time than now to start to ask yourself some of those questions. What do I want from a career? How does that fit into my life plan? So do yourself a favor, download the app and check out all the resources on Mark's website. This is the best opportunity I think you have in the year to do that. So thank you again, Mark, for sharing all of this and wish you all the best in the future. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of the Actually You Can podcast. I so enjoy having you here and I hope you've taken away powerful insights and tools that will support you to achieve your high level results. Now, before you go apply all of this wisdom in your life, I'd be so grateful if you are able to leave us a podcast review on the platform that you're listening to or share this episode with a friend. Your support means that we can help more self-led high-performing individuals just like you expand what's possible for them. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So please go on and shoot me a note on socials and let me know what you think. 
you can find me on Instagram at Miff Galloway. Now, go ahead and make those dreams a reality because actually you can.